just really focus on content and going fast through as much information as I can. Um, and the focus here will be how we follow the Feed the Cats main principles, the core principles, while focusing on a such a technical event like the hurdles that you really have a lot that you could be complex with and work on a ton. So the Feed the Cats principles that I really focus on with hurdles is you got to keep your kids happy, healthy, and fresh with a simple, essential approach. What are the most important things? Um, and putting the athletes first. I think all those three things, those three bullet points go together, whether it's um, not overworking, not overrunning, not over drilling, uh, not over coaching. Um, so I think you have to have priorities and these things may seem um, uh, simple, but I think to focus on speed, you're going to have to sacrifice a little bit of endurance. To focus on speed, you're gonna to have to sacrifice a little bit of technique work. If you're working a ton of technique, you're gonna beat up your hurdlers, therefore they're going to be slower. To focus on health and not have beat up hurdlers, you're also going to have to sacrifice some endurance. And to have high quality full speed reps, you're gonna to have to throw a lot of your hurdle drills out the, out the window. Um, that's one of my main takeaways I hope hurdle coaches take away from today is stop drilling your hurdlers. I'll explain why. So if our videos can work, these are the guys you will see a lot of. If they won't work, I still got a lot of pictures. I don't even need any video. So the two guys standing up next to me, um, never hurdled before in their lives. Um, the one on the left ended up 1435, third place in the state. The guy on the left was like 15 flat. The guy kneeling underneath me is the fastest hurdler in the history of the state. So a good wide range of test subjects. Um, here's, I just got a couple of videos of my two, you know, state champion, state record holder, and third place guys. If you want to watch those videos, uh, YouTube my name, and you'll see this and my drills video. So good resource there is my YouTube, um, just under Alec Holler. So, the first thing you need to know as a hurdle coach is what your role is. And the most important thing is cause, effect, and solution. So the effect is what the hurdler feels, what everybody sees. Why are my arms crazy? Why am I floating over the hurdle? You need to figure out the cause, the root problem that is causing the effect. And then you have to help them come up with the solution. You're doing this wrong because of this. And hopefully through uh, the future slides, you'll um, figure out how to come up with those solutions. Um, like we talked a lot about, you'll see a lot of carryover between blocks, acceleration and hurdles um, because they are very um, visual, visually a lot to be seen in video and a lot to be missed with the naked eye. So um, the other thing is, like, like we said, you know, I, I don't coach a lot of guys after every rep, um, mainly because if they feel like something, like nothing's wrong and that was a perfect rep, you're better off letting them think that than telling them, no, it wasn't. So if they don't come to you and want to see the video, then don't say anything and don't show them the video. But most of them, they want to see what their rep looked like. They want to see, um, you know, what they did wrong, what they did right. And, and you want to teach them what to look for as well. Um, because confidence leads into my next bullet point. The confidence thing is so huge with hurdling. Hurdlers be can become head cases so quick. Same thing with block starts. And I think if you teach them instead of, you know, authoritarian approach or something like that, if you teach them to kind of be able to coach themselves, then they're going to be more confident in what they're doing um, and see what they need to see with that video evidence. I've mentioned before, beware of hurdle drills, okay? I have studied and looked for hurdle drills that are meaningful and good, and um, I've done all of them um, because as a hurdler, um, I was my own hurdle coach, and I could like most hurdle hurdlers, I felt 
a lot of issues and problems in my form that I wanted to fix and I didn't know why. And I would do every drill in the book to try to fix them. And there's just not enough good drills that are worth taking time and quality away from full speed reps to do. And you have to be very mindful of the pounding it takes every landing off of a hurdle. Uh, and that includes um, drills. So I did come up with a good set of low impact hurdle drills that you can do as often as you want. They build muscle memory and I'll, I'll get to those in a future slide. Um, find your minimum effective dose. And that's for, you know, a general rule of thumb. That's for each individual. And um, I'll talk a little bit more about that as well with um, long hurdle races and how I found Minimum, minimum effective dose and how to um, coach that event. Um, and you want to facilitate success. You want them to feel good. You want them to feel what it feels like to run at their goal. So for example, <clears throat> I love a huge discount um, with my hurdles in height and distance late in the season because I want them to feel the cadence that they're about to have when they pop a big PR late in the season that so many of my hurdlers have felt. And I think a lot of hurdlers fall apart at state because they always turn it around and run with 20, 30 mile an hour winds and they cannot handle how fast they're going. And you want them to be ready for that feeling. So I've, I've developed a, a set of rules that um, are kind of like, if I was um, really quickly trying to coach a, a hurdle coach, say, uh, my wife is actually my uh, middle school hur hurdle coach right now. And, uh, help and, help Daddy. and um, so if I was to give her things to always do or not do, this is a good set of them to start with. Um, my two hurdle rule, we never go over more than two hurdles in a single rep. I know that might blow some people's minds. Um, I'll get into that in the next slide. I never do more than 10 hurdles in reps in a day. And that is an absolute maximum that I never come close to in season. Um, I always discount, and that's for the short hurdle races like the 110 highs um, or 100 hurdles for the girls. Um, I'm always discounting the height and distance, meaning I never um, hurdle over race height. Um, we always do our reps in spikes and we always go full speed. I do not understand any reps that toy with the distance and try to say like go 85% or some arbitrary percentage. I hate that. So those are some basic rules I'm going to get into next. So first the two hurdle rule. Um, the reason why I have narrowed it down to, I only work two hurdles is because the, it, it encompasses everything we need to work on within those two hurdles working on a rep over three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, or 10, you're working on the same thing that you're working on between hurdle one and two and over hurdle number two. You're working on the takeoff, the landing, the approach, the sprinting in between, all these things. It just gets repetitive. So I would rather work high, high quality for the first two hurdles than have my hurdler break down as, and get slower over hurdle number three, hurdle number four, hurdle number five. And I time reps and I time by using a huddle technique app where I can slide through frame by frame, hundredth of a second by hundredth of a second. And I time down their, their touchdown. When the, their toe hits the ground, I will stop that frame and take their time. And what ends up happening and what I've seen is people get slower and less quality as they go through working the same thing that you're working on in two hurdles anyway. Um, with in, in regards to long hurdle races like the 300s, they don't need anything more than a regularly scheduled lactate work with sprinters. Your hurdlers are sprinters first. I say that all the time. And if you are confident enough to put a kid in the four by four based off the work you do with your sprint group, then you should be confident enough to put them in the 300 hurdles, which is 100 meters less. They don't need any extra endurance work 
in the 300 hurdles. Um, and this is a tough pill to swallow for a lot of coaches when their hurdler can barely run through the finish line in the 300 hurdles. They're like, what do we got to do? How do you work the last 100 meters of the 300 hurdles? You don't because you can't. And again, these are all things that I've tried. I've tried, we all try to simulate the feeling that you're going to feel at the end of the 300 hurdles. And what ends up happening is you're pounding kids for no reason because you cannot simulate it. And a poor finish is like we talked about cause effect solution. That's the effect, not the cause. The cause is not endurance. The cause is a lack of efficiency. So um, the effect is a poor finish. The cause is a lack of efficiency. The solution is to only work your steps in the 300 hurdle practices. Um, the cause happens or can be fixed within the two hurdles, first two hurdles of any hurdle race. So now the 10 hurdle rule, um, again, that is a huge maximum that I don't even come close to in season. I only said 10, um, A, because it's a nice round number, and B, uh, more for off season stuff. So I do have um, some hurdlers that want to come to me like once a week in the summer, like on a Sunday that doesn't affect any other sport they're doing or practicing in the summer. So, you know, I might do, um, you know, four reps over one hurdle and then four reps over the first two hurdles in the summer. But I would never do that in, in season. Um, and again, if you are working technique by rep after rep after rep, and that would go along with drills as well, you're probably killing confidence. You are probably creating a head case because they are doing the same thing over and over again. And if you can't fix it within, you know, two, three reps over one or two hurdles, you're not going to fix it within 10 of that day. It's going to take multiple days and you're going to have to accept small gains or even no gains at all, sacrificing that technique for confidence. Um, so the rule about discounting, we never hurdle race height ever in the, in the one tenths for one ten practice. Now, with discounting in regards to long hurdles, like the 300 hurdles that we run in Illinois, um, I don't discount at all. I don't think there's any reason to, because the height and distance of the hurdle, um, the distance in the 300s um, are exactly what I'm trying to prepare for in practice anyway. We're just trying to get that rhythm with um, that practice that day, and the height's never an issue in that race. But the, the short hurdles, the 110s, the practice quality is so different than in meat quality that we're practicing, you know, apples versus oranges, comparing practice versus a meat. So we would rather try to simulate what they're going to feel like in a meat in practice. And it's always a good thing to feel being faster as opposed to slower anyway. Um, and and one, one thing that can help you with your discounting is are your hurdlers hitting the proper um, body positioning on takeoff, on landing? Are they reaching for the hurdle? Things like that. If those issues are happening, they can be fixed by discounting and you can practice um, and, and build in that muscle memory through a heavy discount. Um, and the other things to consider is what's the weather What's the athlete feeling like? What's this confidence level? What is the daily focus? Um, and, and incorporate that. Um, are we trying to make a young hurdler more confident in three-stepping? Okay, we, we're probably gonna start out with a heavy discount and then we're gonna slowly move outward. And so that's how the athlete or daily focus can kind of change things as opposed to coaching you know, the state record holder. Um, I'm usually just discounting two baby steps or two feet, you know, 24 inches per hurdle um, for him just to get three, four solid reps, feeling good, feeling right, and get out of there. Um, and then that would lead me to my beginner hurdler progression. Um, I do so by facilitating success 
It is very important for them to feel success early on because if your beginner hurdlers are like mine, they have probably never even considered hurdling because it looks super scary and embarrassing if you fall. So you want to build that confidence quick by just saying, hey, I just want you to focus on your footwork, your steps, your takeoff, your landing. I don't care what you look like over the hurdle. I don't care how high you jump over the hurdle. So I'm not even gonna put a hurdle there. I'm gonna put little flimsy mini hurdles there so you're not even worried about falling. And then we will graduate to the lowest notch, second notch, third notch, and, we, and take it slow. So along with that, my beginner hurdler progression, um, you need to focus on, in, on these points in a progression. So the first thing is you want them to feel safe. You want them to realize that you're to make sure you don't fall. If you just do these three things that with the trail leg, then you're going to be pretty safe and you're not going to fall. Um, and, and the trail leg is the most important thing for not falling over the hurdle. Um, so once you get that safety down with the trail leg, which we're, we're going to talk about those key points with the trail leg later, um, now we're going to focus on the takeoff and landing because that is the next hardest part with hurdling is how to efficiently take off and how to land without collapsing because that is the typical um, beginner hurdler thing to do. They're going to sky over the hurdle just to be safe because they don't want to fall and then they're going to have a hard landing and collapse off of it. So we're just going to work on um, not even the steps yet. I'm not going to work, work on the eight step. I'm not going to work on the three step or the arms. I'm just going to work on feeling more comfortable taking off and landing. And once I feel like they can take off and land and continue running without a huge stop and reacceleration, now we can work on footwork, like the eight step to the first hurdle, which every single high school hurdler, whether it's a boy or a girl, and I would probably argue every middle school hurdler that is um, being put into a meet should eight step and can eight step. So um, I mandate eight stepping, which like my dad said, needs to be the front foot in the blocks will be the trail leg, back foot is the lead leg. That's how you get there in eight steps. Um, and then we're gonna try to uh, develop into three stepping between the hurdles. That is land, one, two, three, and you're in the air. Um, and, you know, I, I've gone through a kind of a, a progression mentally myself in how I think this, this should be coached because for the first time in my life this past year, I had a kid that basically refused to three-step. He was a four-stepper all through middle school and just couldn't break the habit. I hate four-stepping because that creates such terrible habits for the future when you are fast enough and strong enough and long enough to three-step easily. It is a hard habit to break. So um, if your hurdler can't three-step, whether it's a middle school girl that just doesn't have the strength and speed yet, that's fine. Always work to take as few steps as possible. So if they're five-stepping, you should be working to four-step. If they're four-stepping, you should be working to three-step. And what I've learned is, even though my hurdler could not three-step, by discounting and making them three-step, they were still better at the four-step. So it, it's still, it's a universal gains anyway. Arms are the least, least most important thing um, to work on. Uh, I think we had a question in the previous session, you know, what is the um, consequential actions of a block start? Arms are the most consequential action of a um, hurdle technique because they are a byproduct of proper form or negative form um, before the arms become a factor. And we'll get into that pretty soon. So a little more about the long hurdles. <clears throat> we only, the only focus we ever have with the long hurdles is to perfect our steps. So um, we follow the two hurdle rule. We never discount because we're just trying to work the rhythm of that um, long race. Um, and a couple things that I try to avoid are um, switching legs. I hate switching legs. I would rather uh, decelerate after the first hurdle 
to get 15 steps in than go full speed and have to teach them a whole new lead leg that I'm not going to be confident in or trust anyway. Um, so that's kind of how I work. Uh, a lot of times the more elite hurdlers in, for boys in high school, that 15 steps in between the first and second hurdle is tough for them to fit in. I say, that's fine. Let's just take a little bit off the gas and coast on that one a little bit. And now we're going to have even more juice left for the re what rest of the race. So I, I don't let my guys um, switch legs um, unless I'm really, really, for some reason, not worried about their opposite leg. And it just comes so naturally that I don't want to overcoach. Um, we um, perfect our steps by mainly the only thing we do is switch our feet in the blocks. Um, like my dad said, it is very much not ideal to switch legs in the blocks because, you know, everybody has a more comfortable front foot. But to switch your strides from, let's say, 23 steps to 22 to the first hurdle, the only way to do that is switch which foot is up in the blocks. And even if that's uncomfortable, we can be efficient enough to... Uh, for it to be okay and hey at least we're taking away a step so um, if we're stuttering and taking 24 steps I'll, I'll just say that's fine we'll switch our feet in the blocks and let's take 23 that way we keep our our normal lead leg because I would much rather switch feet in the blocks than switch lead legs uh, and I think most hurdlers would agree with me um, and then we um, we want to practice that first hurdle, um, especially the first, in all conditions, whether it's 30 mile an hour wind at our back, 30 mile an hour wind at our front, um, warm weather, cold weather. We want to be ready for all different situations. So let's say we it's early in the season and it's 75 today. It's going to be 75 tomorrow. We got our wind at our back today and we're going to have wind at our back for the meet tomorrow. I'll say, hey, this is the perfect time for us to practice our steps, make sure we get them correct um, for tomorrow. And we'll go over and, and good thing we did because they're kind of stuttering with their normal step count. And I say, hey, great, that means we can take out a step. And so we'll take out a step and that's how we'll prepare for the meet in the next day. And then if something happens like the wind is totally different than we planned for and now it's 30 mile an hour, miles an hour in our face, on meet day, we'll say, hey, that's fine we will switch back to the previous steps. Like we went from 24 to 23, now the wind's in our face. Let's just play it safe and we'll go back to 24 steps. And so um, that rhythm is always at the forefront of our mind and really the only thing on our mind with the long hurdles. Um, bad steps and bad rhythm make look hurdlers look out of shape even if they're not. So that is the first thing you should look at rather than saying, hey, my hurdler finished slow, they need five 400s on Monday. <clears throat> so now the next few slides, I'm just gonna go over the different aspects of a hurdle race that I focus on. Um, and the first one, I'm not gonna spend too much time on because we just basically spent a whole hour on block starts, but um, there is a little bit of a difference for the 110 starts. And um, that is we're only wanting to really push and be long and strong for about two strides, especially if you have a, a strong, um, older, more mature, faster hurdler. If they do a full acceleration, they're gonna probably land on the first hurdle mark within seven steps. So we have to shorten that. So we do a um, two-step acceleration and we go ahead and get eyes on the hurdle, eyes up, and then we get good posture and we start and start to quicken our strides um, after two to four steps, kind of depending on how fast and powerful each hurdler is. For example, Travis, my, my state record holder, he would on a full acceleration land on the, the hurdle mark with his seventh step. So he needed, needed to shorten and quicken his strides after two steps, as opposed to one of my slower hurdlers who could still kind of he'll, he'll get tall and he'll get eyes on the first hurdle but he can still kind of push for four before he starts to shorten his stride um, into the hurdle and really after four steps the perfect in a perfect world 
each step after that until the eighth and final step is shorter than the one before it. So you are progressively getting shorter on each step, which means you're gonna to need to start out pretty long. So I have a video playing. Can anybody see this? Any confirmation? It should be slow motion. It's good? All right. So this is a really strong accelerator. I just think it's a good slow motion view of how long and strong he is um, at the beginning of his acceleration. Go back one more time. So he gets really good push. This guy's at Notre Dame now, really long. He's a five foot eight hurdler, but he has really long strides. And now he's short, short, shortest, boom, into the first hurdle. So that would lead me into the last step of the acceleration into the first hurdle, which is called the cut step. Um, the cut step, the purpose of it, I should start with, is the last bullet point here which is it transfers vertical force, AKA max velocity, to horizontal momentum. So we, it's not like we want horizontal force, um, but we're trying to transfer momentum. We're trying to get that hurdle behind us as soon as possible, which is the whole name of the game. To do so, we have to pull the foot under our hip, um, and to do so, we need to take away the knee drive of the last step, we're going to swing that foot low, pull it under, so the foot lands underneath our hips on the balls of our feet. And I wish you could feel it. We're probably all too old to ever feel another cut step in our lives. But if you could feel it, it's almost like you are bouncing off of a trampoline into or through the hurdle. And it accelerates and builds momentum into um, the landing in the next hurdle. So um, here is a slow motion video. Thumbs up if you can see it, thumbs down if you can't. Okay, we're good. So this is Travis, the best cut stepper I've ever seen. Here it comes. You're going to get a still video of this right here. Pull it under. You see how he landed with no heel. It was underneath his hips and he was really bouncy coming off of it. You'll see it again. I'm gonna to try to slide it through frame by frame. Make sure you guys tell me if this is not working. Thumbs down if it's not. So here it is, the eighth step. You see how it swings low? Thumbs up if you see it, how it swings low. And then it gets to about here where a normal stride would have the knee up around his hip. From here, you will see a pullback motion and a land with the heel directly underneath the hips, and the heel should also be off of the ground. Good high uh, posture, um, even neutral hips leading into the hurdle. So next slide, here he is, rusty early season. You can tell, tell it's cold. And this is not his best. I would love this if, if most of my younger hurdlers would look like this. But for him, I said I would say that was not a very good rep. And he would probably tell me before I could tell him that it wasn't right. Um, because once you feel a good cut step, you'll know it. So it goes from this. The problem you can see is the angle of the knee is out in front of the foot too much. The hip should be forward more to this. So this is mid-season. Now the knee is not so far out in front. Good straight line posture leading in. And keep those questions coming. I can't see them yet, but I will get to them after my presentation. Um, and then here's a little progression. The um, first slow-mo video I showed you. This is one of the first times I worked with this athlete up top. You can see his momentum is going um, in front of him and then he's gonna land with a heel first landing. And on the bottom, this is after just a couple sessions, his knee is slightly bent, but again, for different guys, I'll accept different things. And I was excited about this rep and this still frame, just because of the shin angle between the top to the bottom. And I drew arrows to kind of show you. 
All right, here's a bad one. This hurdler, he's actually one of my really good hurdlers. He was a 15 flat hurdler, but he had to overcome a lack of a cut step. And people overcome a lack of a cut step by doing one of two things. They're just going to vault over the hurdle because you can tell this plant step looks a lot like a certain event where you try to jump high, the high jump, right? This looks a lot like a heel first high jump plant step. So you're gonna probably go up, but this hurdler really fought to stay low and it made him a little inconsistent because the way he overcame was by rolling over that heel to the toe and that actually created more, too horizontal of a push into the hurdle. And so he would hit a, lot, hit a lot of the hurdles. So that was the cut step that leads us into the takeoff, the, the lift off of that eighth step into the hurdle. The first thing you want to look for is the distance of the takeoff for your hurdlers. This can give or take a couple inches, I think, based off the hurdler, but don't get too caught up in like the height of your hurdler, for example, because I have five foot eight hurdlers that take off farther better than a six foot five hurdler. Okay. Um, so the, the seven feet away takeoff point from toe to hurdle um, is pretty rigid, but how you can look at it is making sure your hurdler is hitting the rest of the bullet points for the takeoff positioning. Girls are six to six and a half feet away to get to the proper positioning. Proper position basically looks like a high angle acceleration out of blocks. Okay, so it's gonna be higher than a 45 degree angle. I got like a C minus in geometry, so I can't tell you the exact angle that it needs to be. All I know is it looks a lot like an acceleration, just higher. So you're still getting triple extension. You're still getting uh, no heel action on the cut step. Um, one cue I use is get your nose past your toes and we want hip displacement. I want those hips past the toe before the toe comes off the hurdle. So it should look like this, okay? So it is uh, parallel shin angles. We have good neutral hip position. We have triple extension and hips are in front of the toe before the toe comes off the ground. And then further up the chain, shoulder is past the hips and the nose or the head is past the shoulders. So if your hurdler does not have space to get to this position and not hit the hurdle, then they are taking off too close. This is a good seven feet from the hurdle. And one really good way to make sure is just measure that seven feet away and put a little uh, athletic tape down so you can analyze that on film, show them, and show them the effect, like the effect of you not stepping on this line is you, your hips are hanging behind. Um, one huge cue that I hear a lot that is totally false is um, a folding of the book type cue um, into the hurdle because this position right here in real time, a lot of times looks like bending at the waist. You see a lot of pictures that look like the hurdler is bending forward and keeping their hips behind. But if you look at the still photos or frame by frame video, the hips are coming with, the hips are displacing forward. And so this is the result and you can just feel the speed of takeoff into this hurdle. The guy in the purple behind Travis here went, um, 1441 in this race, and he's a full hurdle behind at Stuart McMillan's 60 meter mark. This is hurdle number six, so it's about 60 meters. So that airborne angle right there, you can tell your hurdler is good if they can get to that point. Um, here is the kind of next step or next frame up from that position where the lead leg is starting to extend, which takes me to the next slide. Um, the lead leg um, 
uh, most people know you need to lead with a bent knee. It does not lead up with a straight leg swing. That is how you get your toe underneath the hurdle and trip. So if you lead with a bent knee, that will help pull your hips forward into that displaced position. Um, that knee, again, we talked about um, a effect, the effect of a proper cut step and takeoff, um, the lead and takeoff distance, the lead leg will extend on its own after a proper takeoff. Um, and it will create a very important stretch reflex between the knees. So the farther your knees get before the hurdle apart, it's like stretching a rubber band and it will lead to a causational um, trail leg speed. Um, again, we talked about with takeoff, keep the hip neutral, AKA do not tilt. Think of your hips as a bowl of cereal and if you tilt it the cereal will spill out we want to keep the hips in line with the spine um, that max extension should happen before the hurdle so here is how the lead leg should go we have my hurdler here is in the white and orange his um, knee started out on takeoff position parallel with the other shin and now he is starting to extend into um, the hurdle. And this is that extension. It cannot get any more full extension than that. And that is before the hurdle. So that full extension, so this is the hurdle. It should happen like a whip. Whip out before, and then it should already start to be coming downward as it moves past the hurdle. And here is that big split. Again, the distance between the knees here is what causes a proper trail leg. So <clears throat> like I talked about with beginner hurdler progression is you want to coach them. The whole coaching point with the trail leg is to get them in the position where they do not clip the hurdle. Um, the speed aspect of the trail leg is causational. It's an effect of a good lead split. Um, so here's the three points that I focus on for proper positioning for safety and speed coming off of the hurdle. So again, I'm not focusing on how fast the trail leg comes through because I want the opposite. Um, I don't want it to come through fast. That's a negative thing. I'll get to that in a second. So first, the trail leg knee should always be higher than the foot. There is never a point in a hurdle race where the foot should so if this hands my foot and this hands my knee there should never be an inversion from where the, where the knee is the foot coming higher than the knee because the foot follows the knee and so if it goes from here now we're going to go here but if we keep the knee higher than the foot then it will come through in the proper landing step that you will see um, in the pictures second thing toe needs to be up and out so kind of dog peeing on a fire hydrant type of position uh, common mistake instead of that toe being up and out um, young hurdlers will accidentally point the toe down and that's how you trip and fall over the hurdle if your toe is up and out if you hit the hurdle guess what you're still safe it will graze the hurdle instead of clip it. and lastly heel to the butt so we want that heel to come in to the hip as close as possible with that toe up and out. If the heel, if the knee is not bent enough and the heel gets farther away from the hurdle, you are going to have to jump higher over the hurdle for clearance. And lastly, be patient with the trail leg. This is one of the most improperly coached aspects of hurdles. I see hurdle coaches all the time. Um, talking about pull it through, pull it through. In the middle of a race, they'll be yelling at their kid, pull their trail leg through quicker, pull it through quicker. And what that ends up doing is creates a non-forceful landing and um, you cannot pull your trail leg through as fast as it will come through in that rubber band response from the lead leg split. So here's what I mean. 
here is um, Travis um, with his trail leg knee just past the uh, hurdle, or no, just past his hip, sorry. And he is, his hips are past the hurdle. So hips are past the hurdle, barely. The knee is just barely past the hips, okay? So I'm gonna compare that. So you can see another picture of it here. Compared to the same positioning uh, my dad's hurdlers in, and this is really tough. Um, this meet, my dad came to me saying, you know, he looks good, you know, what's he doing wrong? It, it doesn't look that bad in real time. But he is at this position, Travis is, you know, six inches past the hurdle with his hips, and my dad's hurdler is a full foot behind the hurdle when the knee is past the hip. So if you look at the trail leg knee, it is past the hip, and he's before the hurdle. Here, the knee is past the hip and he's past the hurdle. So that timing really comes from a good split. Arms, like I said, don't overcoach. Um, I'm gonna get to the landing um, because um, the arms are less important, but here are two very different arm actions um, that it all works. The main thing is I don't want you to cross over the midline with your elbow, and I don't want you to reach out too far because that creates a recoil here, which, so here he's staying square, he's not reaching, he's keeping his arms on his own, their own side. If not, you're gonna land like this. So on this hurdle, this is the result, him turning sideways because he overreached with his arm and that causes an equal and opposite reaction coming off the hurdle. So here again, these two hurdlers are really good. They're both state champions. They're, they're both staying square. And the landing, you want power position, which looks a lot like takeoff. Um, and it's very undercoached because you want a, to stick the one-footed landing. Um, you want to bounce off your lead leg, and you never want to reach down with the um, lead or trail leg landing. So here it is, the landing power position. So to land, this is obviously, you can see and tell how fast they're going to be coming off this hurdle from this position. If your lead leg is, or your trail leg is too fast coming through, then you're not going to be at this position at the correct time to bounce off of the ground. Obviously, if you hit this position properly, you are going to create a lot of momentum coming off that lead leg touching the ground. And the next still frame should be a uh, airborne picture of these two hurdlers. What happens too, too often times with young, uh, inexperienced or weak hurdlers is more of a two footed landing where the first foot does land by itself, but then the trail leg is kind of handling some of that landing as well. Um, I have a few more slides here. Do, do you want to continue or am I going over? Uh, no, you can finish your last couple slides. There's a couple questions up here and um, yep. then we can get to, uh, to Quinn. Okay. Um, so just a little bit about scheduling. Um, three to four hurdle days per week max, ideally three, and that includes meets. So if we have two meets in a week, um, no more than two hurdle practices in that same week and really ideally one hurdle practice um, would be better than two in that week um, and we when we're practicing the short hurdles the one tens we'll typically alternate okay today we're just doing over one the next day we're just doing over two um, you don't have to hurdle every meet that's part of putting the athletes first um, and in the off season you don't need to hurdle um, Focus on speed, your speed days, um, you need a ton of them to see results. And you also need to focus on general athleticism. Um, and that's kind of like we talked about focusing on general acceleration to help with block starts in the off season. Um, so this PowerPoint will be um, sent to you guys. So you guys can kind of go through these sample weeks. Um, just the whole point of the, these, next few slides are be mindful of um, you need two rest days if, with your sprinters and hurdlers 
And it's tough to do if you have two meets, but if you have like a meet like this, where you have just a Saturday meet, you can fit a couple hurdle days in there, no problem. If you have a uh, Tuesday, Friday meet, then you're probably only gonna be able to get one um, hurdle day in if you're gonna try to fit in a speed practice day as well. Um, if you're a coach, um, beware of um, Tuesday, Saturday meets. You're, you're gonna need to build in another rest day there at some point. Um, but you can see in season, you know, to if you're really focusing on health and speed of your athletes, keeping them fast and keeping them healthy, there's not a lot of chances for hurdle days. So that's why just keeping them confident, keeping it simple, focusing on only one thing at a time is the only way to go. Um, so a sample hurdle day, you can once again, YouTube my name for the low impact hurdle drills. We'll do um, our speed drills real fast. We'll do an eight step acceleration drill, just as far as you can get in eight steps without reaching. Confidence drill, and then starts over one or two. So those low impact hurdle drills can be done daily. Zero landing or pounding on these drills. Um, they teach technique and muscle memory. Um, those drills are walkovers, skip overs, lead leg wall drills, trail leg wall drills. And like I said, there's a video of that on my YouTube. And then the confidence drill is a drill with the goal to feel what it should feel like to lead into the hurdle, working on displacing your hips by forcing them to wait to accelerate. So instead of accelerating at the start line, we want to jog at first, accelerate late when they feel it. And now that acceleration, like I said, how the acceleration is so similar to the takeoff position, the acceleration late forces them into proper takeoff position. And then we wanna land far past the hurdle without reaching. Anything I missed or questions? All right, we have a couple questions uh, in the chat uh, concerning hurdles. Uh, the first one comes from Coach Broxerman. He said, what about an intermediate hurdler who struggles running the curve or exiting the curve? Do you alter where you start the hurdler to work on different portions of the race? Um, that is a huge no from me. Um, again, I, I've tried all these things and it just does not work. The problem coming off the curve is because that is when you start to see the effect of inefficient steps, the first four or five hurdles. So if I'm start stuttering to step number or to hurdle number two, you're not going to see that issue on hurdle number three, probably not even on hurdle number four. Typically you'll see that on hurdle number five coming off the hurdle or off the curve. So <clears throat> we talk about race strategy, um, which really our only strategy is um, having good steps. And then we want to accelerate into the curve. So um, one issue we see a lot of is if you do not really reassert and reaccelerate into the curve, you're, you might have to end up reaching for the curve hurdles and that's going to slow you down and create an issue coming off the curve or at best case at the end of the race. So um, the, my best fix is to make sure you're not stuttering to your first two hurdles, re-accelerate into the curve, and then that will take away any issue on hurdle number five off the curve. All right, Coach Williams asks, uh, what would be your standard distance to discount hurdles? So the first hurdle will be like no discount to maximum six inches um, because that one is typically least needed to hit proper positioning to discount, but to hit proper positioning on future hurdles, I would say my rule of thumb is two baby steps or about 24 inches from um, the hurdle mark. So I step, walk it back two baby steps per hurdle. So if I'm doing a second hurdle, two feet, a third hurdle would be four feet, a fourth hurdle would be six feet, and then so on um, from there. Otherwise, we end up reaching and things like that. All right, next, what's your suggestions on training a high school 400 meter hurdler? Again, I, I think it's tougher, obviously, um, for a 400 hurdler compared to a 300 hurdler. 
um, because it's a longer distance. But even though you are adding hurdles to the race, I would still feel confident in the um, conditioning work, or I hate the word conditioning, but lactate work from um, training with sprinters, using that for a 400 hurdler as well. Again, if your steps are efficient, your speed training lactate work should be enough. Coach Palmieri has a state level hurdler who is about six foot three with long, fast strides. He's switched to seven step start. Your thoughts? Don't do it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, like elite worldwide hurdlers, only about half of them do it. So I've had a seven step hurdler. So, I mean, I get it. Um, and I understand the reasons why it, my, my hurdler was a gangly, long legged, legged, tall, slow hurdler that just wanted to take long strides. But I was, he was coming off of basketball. So I only saw him for about six weeks. And so I didn't have much time to change him, but his cut step was non-existent. His takeoff step landed heel first every time. He slowed his momentum every time. And it would be much more ideal for him to cut his strides down and be quicker going into the hurdle, add the cut step to help his speed going through and um, build momentum into the next hurdle. All right. Uh, any tips on dealing with hurdlers who just have poor energy and attitude? My one hurdler sometimes bails out of reps because he, quote, doesn't feel right going between the hurdles but then it ends up shortening the workout and the pentathlete complain that the hurdles are too close. <laughs> yeah, I, I know all about dip, dealing with difficult hurdlers, trust me. Um, I won't get into that too much, but um, as far as bailing out, um, there's a no bailout rule in, in my practices. So if your hurdle, hurdle doesn't feel right, um, you jump it anyway because not every hurdle in a meet is going to be, be perfect. Um, you saw the picture of Travis hitting the hurdle and turning sideways and barely staying upright. I, I don't know, to me, if he's practicing bailing out of hurdles and not overcoming a poor hurdle in practice, he might not have been able to handle that, um, that hurdle in a race. So the rule is don't do it. And if it continues to be a problem, I'll just send him home. I mean, um, if their reps are poor or they have a bad attitude and don't want to do it, then don't have them do it. Um, again, happy, healthy, and fresh is the, the goal. And if he's not happy at hurdle practice today, then he shouldn't be hurdle practice practicing. And that doesn't make him a bad person. Um, I get it. Um, and when the hurdles are too close together, I tell my hurdlers that is a good thing. <laughs> that means everyone takes the same amount of steps in a hurdle race, right? So if they are too close for you, that means your steps can be quicker. And the quicker the steps, the faster you are in a hurdle race. And it should be easier, really, to get into proper positioning. But you just got to get them to shorten up. Uh, Coach uh, Travis asks, with the long hurdles block start, front trail leg, lead leg, question mark? Um, so uh, typical high school boy, um, steps to the first hurdle. By the way, I don't want them counting. I'm the only one that counts. I don't want them thinking one, two, three, four while they're running. I will count and I will check with the video and make sure I know what how many steps. So, uh, for example, Travis, he's really fast. He was a state champ 300 hurdler. He was 22 steps. Um, I've had 21 before um, at an elite level um, for more of like a 43-second hurdler it was on average 23 or 24 steps. Um, and so basic rule of thumb is an even amount of steps means the trail leg is forward in the blocks and odd number of steps means the lead leg is forward in the blocks. And so to take out a step for a 22 second hurdler or 22 step to the first hurdle guy, I would say, um, okay, we're going to switch your feet to the lead leg up in the blocks and you really got to work on focus on pushing out and covering ground. Um, and that will take them to the same lead leg with 21 steps. Right, last one comes from Coach Mann. Uh, similarities between quick step 
and penultimate step in jumping? Oh yeah, very. Um, it's the opposite. <laughs> uh, or or uh, penultimate is the second to last step. So I guess um, uh, the opposite would be the last step for the long jump. Excuse me. The penultimate step. There is similarities. The only problem is, from what I understand about the penultimate step, is you are sinking somewhat in the long jump, and the goal of a cut step is to raise posture you want to raise your hips and you want to try to get tall your hips taller than the hurdle if you can in um, the cut step but there are some similarities from what I've heard of the penultimate I'll mention too here that if people's uh, questions did not get answered that comes along with the show so you know uh, find us online we're easy to find um, send us your questions and we'll answer them for you